previous episode of Alice Podcast, we talked about the Epic of Gilgamesh and Man's Search for Meaning. And essentially, we concluded that there is this universal yearning to understand the meaning of life. And now today, we're going to start asking uh, some more questions really about where this originates in the human animal. And I think that Ernest Becker in his book, The Denial of Death, has a really good perspective on this. And that's what we'll be talking a lot about today. Now, there'll be more information linked down below if you want to go check that out. Also, at the end of this episode, I will talk about what I thought about The Denial of Death by Ernest Becker, in case you guys are looking into getting this book. So our entire discussion starts when we're talking about the biological meaning of life. And now what I mean by this is that if you take away consciousness, essentially the mind, from humanity, what are you left with? And what can we deem as a meaning of life from that perspective? Then, when we in, in the future, our discussion in this episode is going to start with the biological meaning of life. So essentially, take away the mind, take away the consciousness, we're going to ask ourselves what we're left with as a meaning of life in that situation. Once we understand that, that will form a really good foundation for what we'll talk about later in this episode, which is psychologically what is the meaning of life, and we'll continue to build on that. So it starts off, like I said, with the biological meaning of life, moment to moment, to moment basis. Animals, as we know, react on a moment by moment basis. And this is seen in nature all the time. Essentially, the motivation for these organisms is to survive the moment that they're in. So if there's a stimulus that happens in that moment, they will do whatever they can to fix that stimulus, to overcome it, so that they're in a good situation for living, so that they can live. And essentially, when we're talking about this, there's no consideration of the future for these organisms. That's important to notice, even with squirrels. I see people mention squirrels as an animal that can really think in the future about burying its nuts and preparing for winter. But this is, unfortunately, this is misleading. PBS published an article in 2019 where they interviewed Dan Gilbert, a Harvard University professor, and he talked about the effects of the light on the squirrel's retina. And, the, and because it's getting darker earlier in the day, essentially the squirrel is just running this program that's telling it to bury more nuts and prepare for the winter. So there's no conscious activity in that squirrel saying, I need to go and bury more nuts because it's going to start getting cold in two months from now I want to make sure I can find food that's not what's happening that's a misunderstanding what's actually happening is as he explains there's essentially a nut burying program that's being run similar to a computer and this puts the almost puts the squirrel on autopilot and just it's running off of its own instincts and again this is more evidence in the direction of organisms reacting on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. So, what does this mean? Well, if there's no consideration for the future, we can extrapolate that out to where there's no consideration of death, or really time. I'm sure you've heard before that dogs don't have a concept of time. Well, new does any animal. It's because they don't understand the future. And you have to understand the future if you want to have a concept of time. And if you have a concept of time, you must also begin to understand your own death. And this is where humans are unique. We have the ability to ponder our own death. We have the ability to consider the future. And most importantly, perhaps we have the ability to reflect on these thoughts and start thinking about what's going to happen in the future. What happens after death? These are very deep questions, but they arise in an organism that has the ability to think about the future. And that's what we're really going to focus on in the latter half of this podcast episode. So it's really important to understand what this does to the human animal. So remember our animal, moment by moment, not no consideration of the future. Now, the human as an animal has been introduced to a stimulus now that is essentially impossible to overcome. There's no way to fix your current situation if you know that you're eventually going to die. 
Now, this is extremely weird to think about. And again, Ernest Becker has a ton of information in his book about this and about human, the human ability to really think in that direction. And it's important to understand that as we move forward. Remember, now this shifts the focus of the organism, the human animal, from living each and every moment, like we've talked about before, like the squirrel, to not dying. Because that's the biggest stimulus in that organism. It's why we get afraid in certain situations. We're afraid of death. We're not essentially afraid of that situation. And organisms will react differently in those situations because they are not afraid of death. They're more afraid of what's happening immediately, right? And we'll, this will make more sense as we move along. So we're gonna shift gears here and talk about the psychological meaning of life. So the human animal, as we know, has the capability to think of its own death, and we can call this essentially consciousness, which isn't the perfect definition of consciousness. There's many takes on what exactly consciousness is, but I think this is a good place to start, and it definitely plays into consciousness. Due to this added cognitive ability, the emphasis of the organism, like I said earlier, is no longer on living but not dying. This is very, very important to understand. So, this subtle change completely transforms humanity and distinguishes it from all of the world. And as we'll see from this perspective that Becker presents, is that everything we do essentially is to keep ourselves from thinking about death, to overcome that stimulus of the idea of death, because it needs to be overcome. As we mentioned before, with all other animals that are in situations where there's a stimulus, they must overcome that stimulus to be okay in their current situation. And humans are the exact same. So, Ernest Becker has this quote that I think helps explain that a lot. And it's, it goes, the idea of death, the fear of it, haunts the human animal like nothing else. It's a mainspring of human activity, activity designed largely to avoid the fatality of death, to overcome it by denying in some way that it is the final destiny for man. Pretty deep quote right there. And I remember when I first heard it, I was like, wow, that, that can't be true. That's crazy. But as I continue to read this book, it started to really sell me like, wow, this could actually be extremely reasonable. And in fact, I experienced these things. So this comes up with the question, how does humanity cope with death? So now we're going to start way back, way, way, way back to when you were born. When you were born, there's a fight for your identity. There's a physical side and a mental side. And at birth, you lean more in that physical direction, right? At birth, we eat like slobs, poop our pants, all these things that are, con that are really essentially disgusting and frowned upon. But of course, for babies, we don't know any better. But quickly, we start to form and establish a mental or cognitive identity and this at a very early age. This development stage is really peculiar because nobody really knows what is happening in those situations and as the baby develops into a young adult. Now, despite this lack of instruction or this lack of knowing exactly how to approach development, most people end up in the range of normality with the correct ratio of mind to body identity, but there are people who fall on the extremes. And these extremes are kind of hard to understand, I will admit. And I'm in reading this book kind of confused me a little bit about them. But as they've kind of set in and I've spent time reflecting on it, I think that they make perfect. So with the physical extreme, we have depression. And one has come to terms essentially in this situation with their own mortality and physicality giving them no longer a will to live. Now, the other extreme is a mental extreme, schizophrenia. The mind is in complete control, physical functions are impaired, and the mind rules the body. So again, we see this, these two ends of the spectrum. He postulates that people are anywhere along the spectrum, but those are the two extremes. So you could be more physical, you could be more mental, but everybody lies in there somewhere. Now, it's important to understand that this is all in response to the death stimulus. The human animal has developed its identity 
must learn to cope with the stimulus. From a young age, we know that we're going to die, which just sounds kind of morbid, but it's something we have to talk about. It's something I think that's important for our conversation as we move along. So some choose to let it win by conceding to their physicality, while others distract themselves from it by letting their minds rule everything. And these are two different ways to cope with the death stimulus. But again, these are extremes. What's the common way that this happens? Luckily, he provides us with tons of different examples of how this can happen in more day-to-day life. So humans have a desire to be included, right? We want to be, we want to have friends. We want to be part of a community. We want to have people around us that have similar beliefs, that feel that we are a part of their group. We want to be associated with things. But we also want to stick out, right? I want to be part of a basketball team, but I want to be the best player on the team. I want to be, I want to go to school and be in the classroom and learn, but I want to be one of the smarter students in the classroom. And these are all essentially exploiting that innate human desire to be a part of a group and to be unique in the group. And one of my professors gave a fantastic example of this. And it's the hydro class. I have one right next to me as I record this. We want, we want to be a part of that outdoorsy, adventurous hydro class group, whatever. But we also want to be unique. And that's why we put stickers on our hydro class. That's why when it gets dented, you know, it's not a big deal because it shows that our hydro class is unique to us. And again, this is a perfect example, and this can apply to other situations. So I'll give you some more examples that I think will help straighten it out a little better. So take maybe a business corporation. You want to be a part of this business. You want to be an important, maybe even a linchpin for this business. You want to be in a very important part of this business. Is that it? That's exactly the psychology that's being exploited. You want to be a part of the big group, but you also want to be distinguished within it. Now, what we've been talking about in these past, for these past few minutes, is the concept of heroism that Becker introduces us to. And heroism is basically the societal and cultural interpretation of the previously mentioned ideology that we just discussed. So again, a hero is part of a group. We can take Spider-Man, for example. He's a part of a society, part of a family, part of an organization. We... We can also see what makes him different. You know, he has, he has superpowers that completely makes him different from essentially everybody else, makes him stand out. And if we think about it, you know, why are superheroes and superhero stories so popular? Is it because we're innately just interested in these stories because they, for some reason, over-exaggerate this take on human condition, and that is appealing to us. That is something we want to hear. I'll give you even more examples. We take college, and this is very, very important to understand where this leads. So college, you want to be a part of a college. You want to wear your shirt. You want to rep, but you also want to stand out somewhere. You want to be a part of the sports team. Maybe you're a leader of some club or the smartest student in your class all these different things. And what is that essentially? Competition. It's essentially breeding competition. We're getting people to compete to be unique. When the society and organization may be telling everyone to be the same, subconsciously, and kind of around the corner a little bit, it's making people actually compete with each other to be unique because that's just who we are. That's how we cope with things. So society has largely been up, been set up to exploit this aspect of human nature by making things competitive. However, we're starting to see a turn that society is not really meeting the needs of these people. And this is a big problem because competition, heroism, like I mentioned before, is how we cope with our own death. And it sounds weird. It sounds like it's out there, but... I think it really is important at least to consider in this conversation. So society essentially was set up for previous generations. 
And we see throughout history tons and tons of people so elegantly fitting into that hero's role. You know, people who have worked for years and years and years, for their entire lifetime, to be a hero in their community, even if it's at the, the last days of their lives. And this is something that we're seeing less and less of today. And it's important. People need the feeling of heroism in order to contribute more and more to society. But now we're starting to see a crossroads here. How do we figure that out? Unfortunately, I don't have the answer, and I don't think Ernest Becker really has the answer, answer either. But he gives us an understanding of what exactly is going on. And he gives us a main understanding of the outlet. So society was set up for past generations, like I previously mentioned. And since that's no longer meeting the needs of the people in this current generation, people are resorting to other things. As a result, people have shifted to different mechanisms to cope with death. First, drugs and alcohol. Drugs and alcohol stimulate the same part of the brain that heroism does. And this stimulation of the brain essentially replaces heroism. So people get addicted to, they're not addicted to the drug, they're not addicted to alcohol. They're addicted to that feeling of being heroic that is a product of alcohol ingestion. This is extremely interesting because alcohol alcoholism, drug use, all-time highs, frankly. And I think this further illustrates what Ernest Becker is talking about in that societal failure to meet the needs of the people from the perspective of coping with their own death. People don't know how to do it. Another thing, this is a really good example, that helps people cope with their own death is extreme acts or extreme situations. I forget the name of the guy, but he climbed... He free climbed it like a huge, huge mountain. I watched a documentary about it. It was crazy. It was crazy good. And in those situations, what, why he gets so high off those situations essentially is because it forces him in the moment. So this guy rock climbed El Cap all the way up, free climbed the whole thing. I mean, there were parts where he insisted that the camera crew not record. So nobody would see him die if he didn't make it through this, through parts of the rock climb. And it was incredible. But what I want to focus on is that that forced him in the moment so much that he forgot about his own death in those situations. And that's why people get so addicted to these things like skydiving, rock climbing, other extreme acts, maybe hunting crazy animals that have a chance to kill you, bow hunting them. These are the types of things that force people into the moment. Another very famous thing that forces people into the mo moment is meditation. Buddhists and Hinduists, for example, they meditate and this forces them into a more present kind of existence. Again, that the reason behind that is so that they don't think about their future as much, at least. They don't think about their own death. They're living in that moment and that's when people feel the happiest. But what I want to focus on is People are feeling the happy, happiest, not just because they're in the moment, but because they're no longer worried about dying. This is an extremely, extremely important point and really the focal point of this podcast is that death has such a big role in our lives, but we don't realize it. And oftentimes we hide from it. So I like to encourage you guys that it's not a bad thing to think and ponder about your own death and really think about how am I going to cope with this currently? Ernest Becker talks about how in coping with your own death, you will essentially create a new life. And you can't truly understand and enjoy your life unless you, unless you come to terms with your death. Very, very deep stuff that we're talking about. But stay with me here as we wrap up this podcast episode and talk more about what we talked about at the beginning. Before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about transference. Transference is this idea that you can, that certain individuals are so unhappy in their current situations that they will actually transfer their entire mentality and the weight of their own existence onto somebody else. And this is seen in hypnotists, televangelists, healers, miracle workers, and even groups. What Ernest Becker is focusing on when he mentions this is that all these are extremely 
fragile forms of transference and it's not good to transfer your own pain in your own situation that you can't handle onto somebody else. I think the example of a mob really helps illustrate it is that the leader of a mob or leader of just a large group of people is taking on all the worries, all the essentially cognitive strain of everybody else onto himself. And it centralizes the power onto that one individual. And obviously this is very fragile. For example, if this individual is a turn rogue on everybody, this is a huge problem for that mob. He's essentially controlling everybody. And it's crazy to think mob mentality is a whole nother topic, but I just want to touch on a little bit that it shows transference, which is really coming again from that death stimulus, that we don't want to handle it, we want to defer it to somebody else. It's just another situation like that happening. The main point of the denial of death is to introduce us to this death stimulus and the fact that we can't overcome it. But normal ways to supposedly overcome it don't work. So drugs and alcohol, they don't work. Getting a job, being successful doesn't work. Think about the unhappy millionaire, the unhappy, the famous unhappy person. These are situations where that failed. And it fails because none of them prove sufficient. And now Soren Kierkegaard, if you're not familiar with him, he's a philosopher, he's a theologian, he does a lot about, he talks a lot about Christianity. He introduced, Soren Kierkegaard introduces us to this idea of transcendent transference, association of oneself beyond the physical world with some type of supernatural force applies meaning to one's life and justifies the human experience. This is extremely important, and now there's two routes we can obviously take from here. So we're really asking ourselves where and how can humans cope with this? Are humans being selfish by deferring it to something supernatural and this idea of transcendent transference? Are we being selfish in the fact that because we can't handle it, we need to transfer it onto something that's completely outside of reality, completely outside of our physical nature is that the only way to cope with that or is this something that's been programmed into people by perhaps a creator to lead them ultimately to a god these are very very important questions that i hope to answer in these next few episodes of alice podcast if you enjoyed today's podcast please leave a like if you want inf more information about the, the, the denial of death i will talk about that right now so here's my minute review about the denial of death. I thought it was a really, really good book, very challenging. At parts, I wanted to put it down. At other parts, I didn't want to put it down. <laughs> and it was, it's not a super long book, but it took me a while to get through. It's very, very dense, and it deals with a lot of tough situations, a lot of tough topics. With that being said, I think it's an extremely important book. Ernest Becker has a kind of a Christian perspective when he's talking about the idea of transference and when you talk about um, Soren Kierkegaard, so if that turns you off, um, even if it does turn you off, I'd still recommend it. There's a lot of really good information in this book. If I were to rate it out of 10, I'd probably give it like 8.5. I thought there's some information that didn't need to be in there, but that might just be me. I'm sure you guys would find a lot of the information here valuable. I would highly recommend purchasing a copy of this book.